Hi, and welcome to Experience Magazine's Facebook Live. I'm Joanna Weiss. I'm the editor of Experience, and I am joined here by Rupal Patel. She is a professor in the departments of speech language pathology and computer science at Northeastern University, and she is the founder of a company called Vocal ID that is featured in our new story uh, that, that uh, just went live today on Experience Magazine by Stav Dimitropoulos called Hear Your Grandmother's Voice Reconstructed. So the story starts with a, a future state where somebody could listen to a long lost aunt, read a great aunt, read a story to his kids, even though she's no longer with us. It's a kind of a future science fiction state uh, that's a little bit eerie and at the same time, very charming. Um, and and Rupa, the, the technology that your company does is a little, is, is not quite that. Um, but I wonder if you could start by telling us the origin story of your company, which is very profound in itself. Absolutely. Thanks, Jonna, for having me. Actually, we do also do this in terms of recreating the voice of people either who are alive today or recreating the voice of someone who had archives of audio before as well, both famous people as well as those who um, loved ones. And so um, there is, once you have the technology, there's a capability of either recording someone today or taking the recordings and then regenerating a voice. Uh, the genesis of vocal ID, though, uh, came from creating voices for people who didn't have a voice um, from, from an early age, maybe someone born with a speech disorder, such as cerebral palsy or conditions such as, uh, such as that, um, or someone who later in life uh, loses their voice to conditions like ALS or Parkinson's disease. So in, our, in the laboratory, we had figured out a way to create a unique synthetic voice for someone despite having very little audio. So the way you create a synthetic voice um, is that you need audio recordings. And then from those audio recordings, you train a nowadays a neural network it, to learn how to speak like that person. So you typically need a good amount of data to make it sound really realistically like that person. So if you're talking about someone with a speech disorder, first of all, you don't want it to sound like their speech disorder, but you want it to sound like their vocal identity, right? And so what we did with vocal ID in this, in the, when we were in the laboratory, but also the first few phases of uh, what we were doing in the, as a company was having everyday people like you and I um, donate their voice. And you uh, have so to record, donate your voice. Yeah. Donating your voice is very, it's painless. Um, and what it means is going on a website and re reading somewhere between um, two to four hours of um, different stories. They're, they're just line by line stories will be presented to you and you read them out loud. As you read them out loud, I want to ask though, is there anything particular about the stories where they're children's, did you choose particular <clears throat> stories for a particular reason for people to read? So we are now in phase two of the human voice bank, as we call it. Um, in the beginning stage, we had some of the stories that were sort of of copyright. And what we were doing is basically looking for sounds and sound combinations that covered the entire language. And that's because we were building voices in a different way then, using sort of old technology where you glue together little bits of speech. But in the last few years, the technology has evolved so much in speech synthesis that we're now able to say, well, Obviously we need coverage, but we also need breadth of like styles of speaking. Um, and so now what we do is we ask uh, our volunteers, what do you wanna read about? Do you wanna read about uh, science fiction? Do you wanna read about the news? Do you wanna read about like, you wanna read TED talks, right? So whatever they want to read, we present them those things. And obviously if we don't have enough coverage of the language, we will sort of present more content that has that's loaded in that way. But what we're trying to do is get um, an idea of how the how that individual speaks so that we can use those recordings then to create a synthetic voice. And what we do for non speaking individuals is that, that person still makes sound. Um, they can't produce all the consonants and vowels accurately, but their voice, their sound is what we say has its, its particular distinct vocal DNA. And what we're trying to do is infuse their vocal DNA with the accuracy of the speech production of their voice donor. Combine them together and then train a model that sounds like a combination of the two of them. So can you break that apart for us? When you say voice DNA, what is it about? I mean, you, you say in the story, you told staff that even an ah has enough DNA to identify a voice. What is it in particular that you can pull apart that really makes each voice like that unique? There's actually hundreds of sort of vocal features. Um, they include things like the pitch of someone's voice, the range in the pitch of their voice, the breathiness of their voice, the loudness of their voice. 
sometimes some voices are, especially with people with speech disorders, have a little bit of gurgliness, gurgliness in them because they have a hard time with saliva control. So there's a lot of features we want. And then there's also some features we actually have to extract away to say, well, if we're trying to make a voice that's going to be in their communication system as their assistive communication device, you don't want some of the stuff that makes that sound unclear, right? Um, and then of course, you're going to blend it with a voice donor that's similar to them. So accents are important too. If someone has a speech disorder, they're not necessarily going to have an accent, but they might have a particular preference towards one. So when we first started with Vocal ID, I think when we were in the lab, we were, we were really focused on making it sound accurate, like it could be that person's voice. What we've learned a lot from the feedback when now that we have hundreds of people using their vocal ID voices on a daily basis is that accuracy is not always the thing. Oftentimes it's preference. So what do you prefer? You know, um, many of our individuals who have um, lost their voice to conditions like ALS and cannot, did not bank their voice ahead of time. One of the things is they, they actually want a younger sounding voice. Like I call it a voice lift, you know, <laughs> or they, they want a voice that is more pleasant to their ear. Uh, you know, you've probably heard people say, oh, I don't like, I don't like the sound of my voice. If I lost my voice, I'd probably have so-and-so's voice instead. You know, the, the common joke is Mer Morgan Freeman's joke or, you know, um, someone else's vo voice. And I think the thing is, until you lose your voice or until you cannot have that, I think we don't quite know how to grapple with what that is, you know? Um, same thing with a loved one, not hearing their voice has a very different feeling than not seeing their face. Like when you imagine someone that's no longer here, you hear them, you might, it, the hearing them piece is the part that really brings that memory back. The face obviously is important, but what brings the sort of the hair on your arms sort of to come to like to stand up is that the feeling of that voice. Yeah, a lot of people in, Ste in Steph's story uh, talk about that, that having a photograph is a, is a distinct memory. It brings you back to a moment, but what they were looking for was something that felt more present and it was the, the person's voice that they were kind of yearning for. Yeah, I use the example of like, um, my mom now lives in LA and, uh, you know, she's, her voice, I often try to sort of imitate her speech, not to make fun of her, but like part of it is actually to, to make me feel close to her because when I hear her saying, well, but come here or whatever, like she would say to me, that warmth is, is what I'm rekindling a memory and a persona of the individual, not just sort of a moment in time. So if I'm a person who's using your service, who's lost a voice, how, how do I actually, how do you create that voice out of the voice bank for me? And then how do I use it to communicate with people in real life? Yeah, so just like a voice volunteer records their voice on this platform where they line by line you're recording, if an uh, individual doesn't have a voice um, right now or they're born with a condition such as that, they record their samples of their voice online uh, in a different kind of a studio. Um, and then we use both recordings together to create this voice. And then you have a downloadable file that can be downloaded onto a mobile phone or an assistive communication device that's compatible with our voices. Um, and then that's how they use it. So typically there's, if the individual is um, can spell and uses sort of a keyboard, then they just use a written based system where they type out the message and then it speaks it out loud when the message is done. There's like a speak button. Um, for pre-linguistic individuals or those with limited linguistic skills, there's usually icon symbols. They string together their message with the icon symbols. And then once their voice has been built, it speaks it out loud for them. So we were actually, um, featured in a number of different uh, news articles and so on. Um, and there's a one video of a woman who lost her voice. Uh, ABC was doing a series on, I can't remember what it was called now, um, with Ann Keurig. Um, and she was talking about people who, you know, this one individual who had lost her voice kind of in a way that nobody knew how she had lost her voice, her voice. And so she recorded her sound samples. We had some old tapes of her. And then we found a donor very similar to her in age and actually voice quality as well. Cause a lot of the matching we're doing is not just on demographics. It's actually on the vocal quality. We blended those together and now she has a, we, Vocal ID has an app called My Vocal ID, um, but there are other apps out there too that we're compatible with. So once the voice is built, it just basically swaps out with the default voice that's already there, or let's say the Apple voice or the Android voice that's there, and they use their own personalized voice instead. And you also, I think you alluded to before, people can bank their voices ahead of time if they're concerned about losing their voice, right? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Actually, I want to say that in the last couple of years, we've been focusing on these individuals, uh, primarily those with the head and neck cancer. Um, so many individuals with head and neck cancer uh, will have their voice box or sometimes their part of their tongue removed and that makes them um, have very limited ways of communicating. Um, but if they have banked their voice ahead of time, even before they might get like, let's say a, uh, um, a voice, a, a little prosthesis that allows them to talk through the, through the stoma, they oftentimes have no method of communication for several months or when the, when the stoma is being cleaned out or whatever. And so having banked your own voice, it's like, you know, 90 minutes of audio. Um, that's what we need in order to recreate this person's voice. It's been a game changer in terms of having them continue to do their jobs, the social closeness with family members. Sometimes even when these pe people pass, the family members continue to want to use their voice on their assistive communication device as a, ma a means of grieving and social closeness. So I think they're, we're only beginning to understand what it means to have one's unique voice because this was not possible. I want to say 10 years ago, this was hundreds of thousands of dollars to do, right? We're bringing this down to the, the end user that can actually buy this for thousands, you know, for a thousand dollars. That's because of all these, you know, different kinds of grant mechanisms, but also because technology has advanced so much that we can offer this to people that was just not even heard of before. So beyond the healthcare field and the medical field and the people with medical need, what are the applications for this technology? I know you, um, you, you your website talks about a, a devices like Alexa or companies being able to create a brand voice. Yeah, yeah. So we're working with uh, both small and medium-sized companies as well as larger international companies to create their own brand voice. So we're working with a mobile carrier right now where we have um, worked with their voice artist, their their brand, their the person that who's been doing all their voicing, um, and created their voice. Uh, identity, we call it their voice double. So they can use it for other kinds of applications. Talk about phone bank, uh, phone trees, like uh, interactive voice response. Could also be to create new marketing applications. So imagine a, a voice for a brand and you wanna make a 15 second audio sample with that talent is not available. Um, you know, and it, it's not about dropping the talent, it's about making sure that you sort of expand the capability or scale that talent so that they can be available to do all this content. We know that written content is like exploding, but yet people aren't reading with their eyes, they're listening and they're consuming information with their ears. And so now we have to make audible content available to people. So we're working with um, a lot of financial technology companies that want to have their own voice, often also regionalize their voices, depending on um, if they're a national company, you know, can they have a slightly different voice? It's the same person, but can you change that voice um, for those different wow. demographics? So does that mean you, if, let's say a Siri-like figure, you could take that same Siri voice, but impose a Southern accent or a Midwestern accent on that voice? Yeah, so that's a very, very early work. And that's exactly what we're trying to do is sort of, I would call it more styles, right? Um, so there's speaking styles, both accents are definitely, but also things, accents are a little bit harder because you have to make sure that you've got enough of that um, vocal range and that individual speaking style. But um, things like, we don't think about really, um, we were speaking to an older person or if you're speaking to someone in a crowded restaurant or a bar, you speak in a different way than you speak, you know, like we're speaking conversationally right now. And so how do you adapt the voice so that it can do those things and in fact be understood in those different contexts? So, you know, one of the earliest projects I had done in the lab was a project called Loudmouth. So when we talk in a, bar, in, a, in a bar, we talk very differently, right? So we use those same learnings to make the synthesizer, synthesizer speak as if it was speaking in a crowded restaurant, which isn't making every single word louder or higher in pitch. It's actually the content words that are highlighted with those different kinds of prosodic cues in order to make them understood. So there's so much about how humans speak that we, if we can get machines to emulate that, I think there's so many really interesting applications. And of course, there's also the nefarious kinds of use cases, the deep fakes and so on, which we need to protect against to make sure that they don't get out of control. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about that because we definitely, everyone's familiar with some of these really uh, 
common viral deep fakes. There was one with Tom Cruise pretty recently where he's, you know, singing Dave Matthews songs and it's a guy, it's, it's not him, but it's so convincing the combination of not just the face, but the voice. So how do you protect against that from both the producer end and the consumer end? Because again, there, you know, the, if, if you're, you can imagine a world and the and, and stab story talks about this a little bit where somebody has either banked another person's voice without their consent because they're yeah. gone or is taking a person's voice and using it without their knowledge to say something that they never agreed to say. Yeah. So, I mean, when we make a voice, we always have, we have to have consent. Um, in the case of individuals who are no longer with us, um, it's getting an estate consent or we have to have proper consent for that. Um, and the, the other thing though, too, is there, it's a two-part solution, I think. There's a part solution on the, the developer side or the technology side, and then there is a part solution that is on the end user consumer side. So for the end user consumer, there's an education. Um, you know, you have to educate and make people aware of the consumption of this new media because it's gonna, it is everywhere, right? Um, and to understand what is fake and when it's not fake. Um, and also on the, the technology side, it's also kind of being more, clear oh you're listening to and and, and viewing uh, an avatar of an individual this is joanna's avatar she's going to do five interviews simultaneously <laughs> you know as opposed to the one she can do in real time um so things of that sort but if you're trying to deceive i think the other thing that technology providers like us who are creating that sort of like that core technology can do is build in protections within it now when you build in protections within it like such as like watermarking the audio or doing things of that sort you always have to keep evolving that because fraudsters will always find the leak, right? So it's always sort of a whack-a-mole game where if you don't um, stay ahead of the curve, you're constantly catching up, right? And so you, you have to make sure that the, the tools you have to protect the voices are constantly evolving. You can't just say, okay, I'm right. We have this methodology. We're done. You, you actually have to continue to kind of stay on pace. And so, um, Vocal ID, along with a bunch of other uh, synthetic media companies, we um, we created this organization or coalition of synthetic media companies called Ethos, and it's the AI Ethos. The idea is that we, as small companies, it's, it's usually startups in the space that we're talking to. Uh, I think the bigger companies, I hope, will follow suit with this too. But we want to think about the unintended consequences before they become a problem. We wanna make sure that we're proactively thinking about this rather than what we've seen technology do many of the times is sort of say, well, we, you know, we didn't expect it to be this way. We, this is not what we, that it, what we imagined. We can imagine a future where synthetic media gets misused. So we have to, from ahead of time, be having this conversation, A, and B, um, building in the safeguards within the technology itself, as well as doing the education. I mean, I think that's, Many of the talks I give these days are actually centered around this very concept of, well, what does it mean? And, and what is our responsibility ethically um, as a technology provider to make sure that we don't um, inadvertently create a problem when we were looking for doing, to do something that was a social good, right? That's amazing. That's amazing. And you're right there the, for, for a long time, it, it felt like the tech industry was catching up. And so mm -hmm. to, to address these issues on the front end and anticipate them on the front end feels like a game changer. Yeah, and you can't plead ignorance to say, you know, we, we had no idea. We've seen enough to know that we, we absolutely have an idea. Yeah. Is there anything we've left out uh, about, well, about the, the technology and the way it's being used? What, what should we be looking for next? What's, what's the, the future state of this? Oh, it's, that's such an interesting conversation because I just was on a panel earlier today talking about soundscapes and why soundscapes, why now? I think we're at a really interesting uh, pivot point in terms of the technologies around us, the hardware. Think about all these you know, headless speakers and Alexas, Googles, so Google Homes and so on. Um, so that provides the sort of the, the framework to have these audio experiences, right? But then the, the habits of individuals wanting not only to read content, but to listen to content. I think we're just, we're audio, it has this, it's this new sonic renaissance we were calling it in our last meeting, um, which I think is a really exciting time to think about like how audio plays into our lives again. We're not being interrupted necessarily by contact information that directs our eyes to like a phone, but we can hear it and it can enter the conversation a little bit more um, I, and without being distracting. I think, uh, I think I think there's a there's a lot to be said for what audio can do 
but audio is also single stream. So I think the one thing about audio is that you have to be present, right? And I, I think that that's one thing where it, it kind of brings you back to what is important in the messaging. We're gonna have to really think about, if you think about a lot of websites today, they have so much stuff written on them. But if you had to convey that in a succinct way in a 15 second spot, what would it be, right? Um, so I think we're gonna have to think about content creation in a very different way. So today you can't, some companies are just thinking that their audio strategy is take what's written and do it, a, a, you know, an audio cast of it. It's like, that's no one wants screen readers in everything that they do, right? What they want is an audio experience. And so I think music, sound, sonic design, audio, I think these are gonna be really important. And what's really exciting to me about audio is that it opens up accessibility in, in a very different way. Obviously there are some people um, who are hard of hearing or deaf that for them, it, it, we can supplement it with subtitles, but I think there's a lot of the population right now that's maybe not literate that can't actually access written content today, but they are, they're, you know, they can hear and they can understand, they're conversational. And so I think that will open up a lot of markets that today are not accessible. Well, Rupa Patel, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing these stories. Uh, this is so fascinating. And thank you for everyone who watched on Facebook Live. Uh, you can find this story and many others at Experience Magazine's website at expmag.com. Thanks so much and have a great day. Thank you, Jen.